Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris McElane, and it's my job to welcome you to this latest installment of our Lunchbox Science series. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognise their continuing connection to the land, the water and the culture. I'm currently on the land of the Guigal people who are a Darawal speaking nation. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And I further acknowledge the traditional owners of the country in which you were on and pay respects to their elders, past, present and future. Uh, I would say that uh, during the presentation, you can submit questions uh, using the uh, Q&A tab that's there at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Okay, so it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Carl Kruselnicki. So Carl, as you know, loves science to pieces. He's been spreading the word for more than 30 years. He's the author of 47 books so far, and he's a lifetime student. He has degrees in physics and mathematics and biomedical engineering, medicine and surgery. In 1995, Carl joined us and has been a Julius Sumner Miller Fellow at the University of Sydney since. And in 2019, he was awarded the UNESCO Kalinga Prize for the popularization of science. This puts him in the same league as previous recipi recipients, such as Margaret Mead, Sir David Attenborough, Bertrand Russell, and David Suzuki. So with no further ado, I'm gonna hand over to the wonderful Dr. Carl. Okay, look, so hello, we're up and running and welcome to me here at the University of Sydney. I'm actually on campus. Ha, how's that for weird stuff? So let's start, start uh, with a bit of a quiz. And I think, Chris, I do believe that you authorised that the winner of these quizzes, we could give them a luxury European car, a block of flats in Tasmania. So for the first slide, what is common to all of these cities that you see on the screen? I know New York, Cordova, Carthage, Fez, Mohenjo-Daro, Merv, yes, anybody with the right answer? Ah, oh, too late. These cities were at one time, each of them ha having the largest population of people in the whole world and head of a mighty empire. And over the last 5,000 years, they've all sort of come and go and fade away. One thing you notice about them is that they're all in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, no, not much happening in the Southern Hemisphere, apart from Australia and Africa and South America. And back in the 1920s, our colonial masters thought that Australia was good for one thing, which is wheat, which is that sort of meshy area that you can see outlined there. And look, if you really looked hard at Australia back in the 1920s, maybe there was something else worthwhile, a bit of sheep, which is that overall green area. But the you know pretty well half of Australia was useless. It had no sheep, no wheat. So it was good for nothing. How little did we think of things back then? And finally, for your third chance to win the luxury car, what is common to each of these countries that are shaded? And the answer is they are the only countries in the world that have free education. The reason I've been able to get to where I am right now is because I've had 28 years of free education as a result of having a government that thought that education was a worthwhile investment in the future. I had free education. You deserve it. I matter. You matter. You all matter. We all matter. You matter until, of course, you multiply yourself by the speed of life squared and then you energy, ha ha ha, science joke, e equals MC squared, come on, Albert Einstein. And way back a century ago, he made up so many clever things, like he looked down a microscope and he saw the little particles jiggling around, brownie in motion, and whereas tens of th thousands of people have looked down a microscope and seen the particles jiggling around and thought, oh yeah, stuff jiggling around, don't know what it is. He looked down there and said, ah, that proves that atoms exist. And he wrote a paper on it in 1905. In 1905, he wrote five papers, each of which could have won a Nobel Prize. What an what a, what a out there thinker. And he said stuff about gravitational waves, that if big heavy lumps uh, would run into each other or accelerate, even small lumps, you'd get off gravitational waves. And finally, we discovered some that happened at a very big event, that happened a long time ago and a long way away, one and a half billion light years away, one and a half billion years ago, where two black holes, each with masses of around 20 or so, or 30 or so the times the mass of the sun, smashed into each other to make another black hole, which was missing a bit of mass. If you do the mathematics, you'll see that you're missing three solar masses. Those three solar masses got turned into energy in about a tenth of a second. And for that tenth of a second, put out more power than every star 
in every galaxy in the universe multiplied by 50. Oh my God, just from two black holes running into each other. And since then, we've just discovered heaps of them. And when these gravitational wave things happen, they distort the fabric of space. And as you can see, left, right, and up, down, but also backwards, forwards, and also of time. We'll just forget about the time for the moment. Let's just concentrate on the distortion of space. And so we finally managed to work out how to make a detector to pick up these incredibly small and very weak gravitational waves, which we did by getting a big fat laser and then aiming it at that uh, split mirror thing. And half of it goes over to this mirror and bounces back and down. And the other, oh, sorry, and goes across the light detector. And the other half goes up to that mirror comes back down and goes to the light detector, and they should be in phase. When they're in phase, when nothing's happening, when everything is normal and there's no gravitational waves of any size rippling through the Earth, the two arms are of exactly the same length. That arm there is as long as that arm. And so the hills of one wave meet up with the valleys of another wave. And over here, you got nothing. Nothing is what you get until a gravitational wave sweeps through the Earth one arm gets a little bit longer, the waves get out of step and blow me down, you get a signal. And this actually happened to the Earth. The Earth is about 12,700 kilometers in diameter and it changed in size. The actual dimensions of the Earth change by two and a half times a thousandth of a millionth of a millionth of a meter, which is pretty small. In fact, it's only two and a half times the diameter of a proton, but at the LIGO place where they did the measurements, the uh, gravitational observatory, uh, they were able to measure a change in distance across that four kilometers of one ten thousandth of the diameter of a proton. Now, doesn't that make you actually get very impressed with how good we humans are that we can measure that kind of stuff? Absolutely astonishing. And so when we go over to this next one here, we now got to the stage where we can detect gravitational waves. So the obvious question is how long before we can make gravitational waves where that'll give us what we really want, which is a hoverboard as in Back to the Future 3. But there's something very interesting about the timing of the event. Remember, I talked about how the gravitational waves distort time as well as space. On the 14th of September in the year 2015, the Prime Minister of Australia was deposed and replaced by another Prime Minister. And on that same day, a gravitational wave rippled through our planet and rippled the fabric of space and time. The obvious question is, who are the authors of that gravitational wave paper? And the answer is these people, a couple of thousand of them at these institutions. And here's their abstract. And if you look at the names of the authors, you can see that they are Abbott, Abbott and Abbott. A coincidence? I don't think so. After all, there's 24 cans in the slab of beer and 24 hours in a day. That is not a coincidence. So the way that the scientists were able to keep on doing their work was by having coffee. And coffee is basically the universe's way of turning intelligent thought into action or theorems. It does have a bit of a problem with a slight diuresis. Nothing as serious as the diuresis or the massive urine flow you get when you do the thing called breaking the seal. So for those of you who are not familiar with this phenomenon, let me explain breaking the seal. So what happens is that you go out for a few little drinkies with your friends and everything's just perfect. And so you have maybe one drink more than you normally have or two. And you suddenly find that um, you all of a, very, very rapidly, you get this incredible urge to pass water and you go to the bathroom and you pass so much water that you're in danger of getting friction burns on the inside of your urethra and in fact it keeps on happening all the night welcome to breaking the seal and what is the cause of breaking the seal is there an actual physical seal no the cause i give you the answer in six words separated by a comma and it goes drink a six pack but urinate a ten pack more goes out that comes in. How can this be? And the answer, of course, is drugs and just sheer volume. So with regard to drugs, in your body, it is incredibly important that you keep your saltiness very much at the same level. So depending on how little or much you drink, your urine color changes you, and how much urine you generate from huge amounts of urine 
with, with a very, very light color to a very small amount and dark. But the important thing is that your hydration has been kept constant. And this is um, interfered with by drugs. It's normally maintained by a hormone in your brain, but it's interfered with by drugs such as alcohol, which is quite amazing when you think about alcohol, that not only can it store parts of bodies for a quarter of a thousand years of like an axolotl limb in a jar and in small quantities it can also make people less shy but also it has an interfering effect uh, on this hormone in your brain which means that if you drink 200 mils of beer 320 comes out now you're looking at that and you go hang on 200 factor that up to a six pack well, then 320 should go to a 9.6 pack. Yeah, I know. I told a mathematical lie because it didn't scan. You know, to say drink a six pack, urinate a 9.6 pack, it doesn't scan. So I lied on that thing. But the other thing involved besides the drugs is just the sheer volume. You don't go around somebody's place to have 15 six packs of green tea or milkshakes. No, but you will have beer. Now, so a little bit of beer is good. Um, too much is bad i guess as in most things I, i'm kind of liking just the simple elegance of a rum and cola firstly because it tastes so nice and secondly because it is so educational our society is drenched in alcohol you had a good day you'll have a drink at the end of it had a bad day you have a drink you're meeting some friends you have a drink no matter what you have a drink but we do not know the science of alcohol. And you think that is a pretty big statement to say about me. You're thinking to yourself, I'm pretty sure I know what happens with alcohol. Okay, let me lay this quiz on you. Consider the drink called a rum and diet cola. Compare it to another drink called a rum and regular cola. The difference is the 15 spoonfuls of sugar you get in your can of cola. They have these two drinks. They have the same amount of alcohol. Okay, show of hands, who knew the diet drinks get you drunker, right? Most of you did not know that. Um, and that just shows that our society is missing many of ticking the boxes and HR, we need more bureaucracy, more paperwork, hooray. But why does this happen? Why does a diet drink get you drunker? Check it out on my TikTok feed, because of different amounts of energy. So let's just run through the scientific paper that started us off on this and get to the energy. So artificially sweetened is a fancy way of saying a diet drink. Regular mixer, well, rum and cola for mixer. Regular, it's got sugar in it. Increase gastric emptying. Now, the gastric emptying refers to your stomach, which is a small organ directly underneath your esophagus over on the left-hand side of your upper tummy right? Uh, and there's a tiny amount of absorption of alcohol from the stomach, but really it only gets absorbed further down the line, you know, in bulk in the small intestine. So you got to, if you want to drink, get the effect of alcohol, you got to empty your stomach and get the alcohol being absorbed in the small intestine. Now three, here come the numbers, three rum and diet colas give you 225 calories. There's no sugar. But the three regular colas have got a lot of sugar. And so that virtually doubles the amount of calories. Okay, same amount of alcohol, double calories. Now, this was a big surprise to me to find out that the stomach pushes its contents on into the small intestine, where the majority of the alcohol absorption takes place at not a volume rate, but a calorie rate. I had no idea. Two to three calories a minute. And so the longer that it stays in your stomach, sure, you can have an increased amount of alcohol breakdown, but also it means that as the alcohol gets pushed out, there's less of it getting pushed out and over a longer period of time. And so we now have the terribly sad metaphor of morality play of two twins who have lived everything identical in their whole lives until this particular day when they go out to a party and one of them has three rum and regular colas and their blood alcohol level goes up and begins to go down. But see, it only gets to 0.03. They hop into a car, drive home, get pulled over by the cops. Nothing to see here on your way. But the other twin, because they're having the diet colas, it then goes a bit different. 
And here they reach a higher peak, 0.05. Oh my God, they get picked up by the cops on the way home. There's a bit of a miscarriage of justice. They end up in prison, sharing a cell with a very large hairy van with love and hate tattooed on their knuckles. They end up entering the Hells Angels gang as a nom and work their way up. And when they get out of jail on this alcohol charge, they end up sitting on a big fat Harley Davidson with the engine rumbling away very loudly with a bare fat that belly and a leather vest selling methamphetamine to your children and nieces because our society does not teach people that diet drinks get you drunker. Hopefully this message of good hope will get taught to future generations and we'll end up with a better society. But we have other messages of good hope today so we can stop and reverse rising carbon dioxide levels and climate change. We are living second message in the most peaceful time in human history. Third message, each generation is smarter than the previous generation. And fourth, we can fix COVID-19. So looking at the climate change thingy, it turns out that there's been a massive cover of climate change of up to a billion dollars a year by the big fossil fuel companies since 1990. Believe it or not, in the 70s and 80s, the fossil fuel companies funded the best research into climate change because they could see that they were causing it and they accepted that it was real. And when the scientists finally had enough information in 1990 to make predictions saying this is what's going to happen, the fossil fuel companies chucked the UE or backflip and started telling lies. The second thing about carbon dioxide is that it's a greenhouse gas. Where does the heat of global warming come from? It turns out it comes not from the actual burning of the fossil fuels, but from the generating of greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide. And it acts like a one-way valve. It traps the heat of the sun and doesn't let it out. How much heat does it trap each day? 400,000 Hiroshima bombs of heat per day. You can get away with that for a day or a week or a month or a year or a decade, maybe two decades, but not for as long as we've been doing it. Um, why? Why did we burn fossil fuels? Because they're loaded with energy. The energy in a barrel of oil is equal to the energy output of a human laborer for 10 years. 10 years labor, half a million dollars. A barrel of oil, 50, pick one. That's why we went for burning fossil fuels. The effects of climate change, well, besides making Sydney the hottest place on earth, on the 4th of January last year, as well as burning one fifth of all the forests in Australia, including rainforests that haven't burned in 10, 15,000 years. We've also tipped the earth off its axis and it seems as though we've made the earth spin faster. Oh my God. Um, and how to fix climate change, we can fix it. Here's a good message. So if you go to get the international uh, point of view, uh, go to drawdown.org and read the drawdown review. 104 pages uh, in a couple of hours, no big deal. And they talk about climate solutions, which go into three categories. The first one is that we reduce the sources and we can do that remarkably quickly. The only thing stopping us is a billion years of disinformation thanks to the fossil fuel companies. And then we can start sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere with everything from uh, or natural organic sinks all the way down to military industrial versions. And the result, is it will improve society for all. So we can go to zero emissions and bring conditions back to what they were in the 20th century with the technology today. We don't need any new technology. We just need politicians to do it. Following example of what the politicians did with regard to CFCs and the ozone hole. Information given to the politicians, 1985, banning of CFCs, 1987. So drawdown.org gives you the global view for a local view. Go to bze.org.au, beyond zero emissions, zero carbon Australia research. And they've written this wonderful document called the Million Jobs Plan. And it deals with all aspects of Australia's society and culture, including helping ex-coal mines in Western Australia and getting sunlight from the heart of Australia and then sending it via cables in electricity form to Asia, renewable energy buildings. Australian buildings are so badly built that we get more deaths from cold than we do from heat in Australia. 
Um, and you think, oh, but my build, my house is a three star standard. The average in Australia is 1.8 stars. You think that five stars is good? They lied to you. The developers forced us, the the uh, politicians into getting a 10 star uh, 10 star scale. So five star sucks. Transport, we can fix. Agriculture, amazing. If you get cattle and you feed them 1% of their diet as a certain type of seaweed, you reduce their methane emissions by 95%. So much risk we can do. Industry, exporting hydrogen. The thing about fossil fuels is that there are jobs like crazy. It's not massively automated and the jobs are local. Now think about families. Families do not like FIFO, fly in, fly out. Okay, so somebody is earning big money, they fly away for three weeks, come back for the fourth week, go away again, they're back the fourth week, the family breaks up, they've got money, but they're broken up. Let's go for renewables where you get many more jobs and they're all local. So we need action at all levels, including personal and local council and state and federal, especially federal, because something this big needs a big reply. And this is a good example of that is what happened on the 7th of December in 1940 when Pearl Harbor got bombed. Up until that day, in the previous half century, the United States had made 3,000 aeroplanes. In the next four years, they made not another 3,000, they made 300,000. 300,000 big planes, like this B-24 Liberator weighing 30 tonnes with big engines so it could go fast, huge range. And the federal government made the decision to tell the car companies to stop making cars and to start making aeroplanes. And so Ford started off with some virgin ground and they built within less than half a year the largest single storey building in the world, a kilometre long, third of a kilometre wide. And they were pumping out these planes at the rate of not once every month or fortnight or week or day, but once every hour. That's the sort of commitment we need at the top level of each government around the world, as we did at the beginning of the Second World War, with the advantage is that we'll have a very robust economy making stuff, but at the same time, we won't be killing anybody. In fact, doing the exact opposite. And these aeroplanes, these aeroplanes that they were pumping out at the rate of one an hour, instead of having 15,000 parts, like a car of the 1940s, they had 500,000 parts. They were highly technical parts and high tech as opposed to low tech in a car. And they were assembled by skilled people, not unskilled people. And you're saying, I keep on talking. You say, Dr. Carly, keep on talking about how the fossil fuel companies are lying to us. They, I know big tobacco lied to us, but surely fossil fuel wouldn't tell us lies. Well, big alcohol lies. So why shouldn't fossil fuel? And you're saying big alcohol? Yes. In August 2018, the poster on the left appeared in every hospital in Australia. And you'll notice it's got three paragraphs as opposed to one on the right, which has got two, which replaced it. And this big poster had as its first paragraph the following lie. It said, it is not known if alcohol is safe to drink while you are pregnant. It is not known. Complete lie. It has been known for decades that alcohol is unsafe to drink while you're pregnant. And the only reason they were doing this was not because they specifically wanted to have an increase in the number of mentally retarded, physically malformed babies, but they just wanted these pregnant women, a small percentage of the population, to start drinking alcohol, which would increase their sales. There was nothing personal about it. It's not personal, son. It's strictly business. It's not personal, it's strictly business. They're, so we just have to treat them like business. They're ruining the world, let's just boot them out. So we can go for a zero carbon world in 10 years with regard to steel and concrete, which between them make 15% of carbon emissions. We can do that carbon free in 10 years. Um, there already a Swedish company is producing carbon free steel. Transport, 15 years, batteries and a bit of hydrogen for long haul. Livestock, five to 20 years. There's nothing stopping us, only the political will. Second message of good hope, we are living in the most peaceful time in human history. Read the book, The Better Angels of Our Nature from the library by Stephen Pinker. Um, one thing I do have a bit of an issue is that Stephen Pinker has more hair than I do. And also that book has 1,024 pages, but he deals with everything exhaustively from the big scale, like wars to the small scale, like person to person conflict. 
And on a big scale, um, you ask the question, was World War II on a percentage basis the most bloody war in the history of the human race? And the answer is no. Uh, back in the year 755 AD in China, to put down a revolt by a certain An Lushan, the Chinese emperor killed one in every three people in China, one in every six people in the whole world. The Mongol conquests kill one in every nine people. Second World War, one in every 44. Still bad, but going down. And then if you look at the small scale, like, for example, murder in Europe, and if you look at these numbers here, we're getting 1,000 deaths per 100,000 people per year, or 100, or 10, or 1, or 0.1. So this is a logarithmic scale, so it's just plummeting. With regard to judicial torture, there's only one country left in the whole world where it is written into the law that it is okay to torture somebody, get a conviction with that, uh, get a confession with that torture, and then convict them. Executions for crimes other than murder is slavery. They're all heading the right way, which is less. Why do you wrongly believe that things are so bad? Because of the motto of the media, which is if it of the commercial media for which I worked for several years. If it bleeds, it leads. You get a car accident outside a school library or you get a donation of books to the library. Which one makes the news? The one with the blood. So we can fix global warming. We are living in the most peaceful time and we are, well, not me, but you are smarter than me. Each generation is smarter than the previous generation. It's called the Flynn effect. Here's Flynn. And the way you measure IQ is you start off with a test um, you measure, you know, if Fred is taller than Michael, what colour shoes does Sandra wear? That sort of test. Turquoise, obviously. Um, and so you give them a test to see if they get the right answer. And then you adjust it left and right until the average is about 100. And then you squash or expand it so that two thirds of the population fit in between a score of 85 and 115. And over here at 110 with an IQ of 110, is me, I'm not particularly smart, I'm just well-educated. Thank you, Government of Australia, for seeing education as a worthwhile investment in the future. So I'm over there at 110, but a little while ago, the University of the Sunshine Coast uh, invited me up there and gave me this gorgeous floppy gown to wear and a beautiful hat and gave me this bit of paper. And on the paper, it said that I am a doctor of the university, but I cannot tell you lies, I'm only an honorary doctor, but still I'm a doctor of the university, which does mean that instead of being just plain old Dr. Carl, I'm actually Dr. Dr. Carl. Doctor, doctor, give me the news. I got a case of loving you. Moving right along. Now the IQ tests are calibrated to give an average of a hundred. And most of you have taken the whisk which has been recalibrated upwards because you're getting smarter, different versions with time. So if you did the uh, IQ test of your parents, you'd get 109, of your grandparents, you'd get 118. How do we know this? Because of Flynn's work and the American military putting everybody that they took into the military since 1932 into IQ tests under hard military conditions. And we've been seeing this not just in the USA, but in every country around the world where they bother to measure the IQs of their students. And we can see the IQs gradually climbing up at around 0 0.3 of an IQ point per year or nine points every generation. And there are different versions, you know, the Ravens matrices or the um, similarity subset. We know it's real. We don't know why but we know it's real. Maybe it's because back in 1900, only 3% of people had jobs involving thinking. Now it's about 30%. It's also maybe, because, maybe, maybe, because we've become more abstract. So if you go to a student um, in high school today and say, um, or back in 1920 and say, why does, tell us about a cat and a dog. They'll say the dog chases the cat. Whereas today they'd say, well, they're both lactating quadrupeds that have varying roles. Are you interested in their physiology or their effect upon the psychology of humans as, as pet animals, or perhaps their greenhouse effect and the cost that they have? Either way, we don't know why, but we know that they're smarter. And then we come to our last message of good hope, which is that we can fix COVID-19. 
Here's the virus itself. Now, some of you might have heard that vaccines cause autism. That is a lie that was started off by Elle McPherson's boyfriend a few decades ago. However, it does turn out, according to the Saturday morning breakfast cartoon, uh, a very highly reputable source up there with nature and science, that autism spectrum people are overrepresented in research science, which means, OMG, that people with autism cause vaccines and also save babies. Hooray. So now for the fix, as I see it, um, for um, the COVID-19. It turns out the most widely used vaccine in the history of the human race on Earth is for one is one used against the coronavirus. And it's been given for half a century. And you're thinking, hang on, but COVID's only been around for a couple of years. Oh, it's been given for half a century and it saves billions of lives each year. And you're saying, hang on, there's only a, just under 8 billion people on the planet. Yes, it's been given for half a century of life and saves billions of lives of chickens every year. Chickens. And there's a lesson for us. So way back in 1937, a completely harmless coronavirus in chickens mutated to be able to infect 100% of a flock within 24 hours and kill them via lung and kidney disease. It took a while, but we had our first commercial vaccine about half a century ago. The situation today, rolling forward, is that there are hundreds, about 400 different varieties of this nasty, lethal vaccine, and about 100 or so vaccines, which are given in different combinations against this very nasty coronavirus variant, which affects chickens, but not us. Um, and how come we're in this situation that we've got so many chickens that the weight of chickens is greater than the weight of all the other birds put together? Because virtually every single commercial chicken is vaccinated on the day it hatches and, a day's, uh, and then two weeks and four weeks after that. There would be virtually no commercial chickens without vaccines. There'd be no such thing as, and I know this is going to break your heart, a chicken schnitty, fried chicken, baked chicken, boiled chicken, or chicken soup, or even chicken soft. It would not exist. If you wanted chickens, you'd drive the outskirts of your city or town, and there might be a farmer, and you bring it back and you say, people say, what's this? You say, it's chicken. What's chicken? This is chicken. Yeah. Mate, the only reason we have chickens is because we vaccinate them every two weeks against these vaccine, these viruses that are trying to kill them. So we can do the same for humans. We have to do the same for humans. Two hours ago, we had roughly 200, a quarter of a billion documented cases. That's different from the total number of cases. These are proven documented cases with total deaths just under 5 million and about just under 7 billion vaccines given. Looking over time, since it began in early 2020, you can see that we've had a bit of a ramp up over here and then wave number one, wave number two, wave number three. Three different waves of cases, documented cases, which are different from cases in general. We've had three different waves of deaths. And um, you can see the deaths seem to be going down. Hooray for the vaccine. Yes. Hooray for the vaccine. Every year. So what's going to happen is we humans are going to get the current COVID-19 vaccines, plural, against the current strains, which sounds remarkably like the flu shot, but with a difference. So in the next decade, you'll go to your GP, you'll have all of your DNA and say, ah, I can see that you've got certain strengths and weaknesses in your immune system with regard to COVID-19. And then they'll find out where you're going, London, Wollongong, New York, and work out what COVID-19 variants are there. And then in the doctor's surgery, this is my prediction, which is raised very lowly by some people who are professionals in the field, but luckily because I'm not a professional, I can go and make these wild predictions bearing in mind that it's very difficult to make accurate predictions, especially about the future. And so in the doctor's surgery, they'll have a 3D printer, and in 10 minutes, they'll print out a COVID-19 set of vaccines, plural, traded, tailored for your DNA and your locations. How long before we get there? Soon, I hope. So we've come to the end. Thank you very much for coming here. And now we're open for questions. Thanks, Carl. Another exciting lunchtime session. Hope you all enjoyed it. 
so let's start. We've got about 20 minutes uh, for questions um, and we've got some here already. So yes. I'll start firing away, Carl. Sure. Um, so our first question, um, our vi are vitamins absorbed through food better for you and your body than uh, vitamins absorbed through a multivitamin tablet, i.e. Well. Diverse food diet that includes most of the daily requirement of most vitamins be better, worse, the same as a very narrow food diet that is supplemented by a complete multivitamin tablet. Go, go for the natural foods. Um, there was a classic case um, of um, antioxidants. Now, you've probably heard of oxidants, whatever they are, they must be bad because. People on TV always tell you to take your antioxidants and they're trying to advertise them with various drug companies. Um, and there is a, a kind of an element of truth in it. You find these antioxidants um, in vitamin C, for example, is one in fruit and, and the yellow vegetables have them as well. So a study was done with people, a large number of people, a large number of people who had lung cancer. And because it was such a large sample size, we could make predictions about what would happen. Divide them into two groups. One bunch just live life as normal, lung cancer from smoking. The other half were put onto a diet rich in antioxidant chemicals. And blow me down, part of the way through the study, their death rate dropped so much that they had to cancel the study because it was unethical to go on. And then they started advising everybody to go on to um, foods change your diet to have a very diverse bunch of foods to get a very diverse bunch of vitamins, including antioxidants. But they thought, well, we, we've done some good here. If a little antioxidant is good, then surely more is better. So they started giving these people with lung cancer antioxidants from tablet form. They started dying sooner than if they took no antioxidants from vegetables or didn't modify their diet. It actually killed them faster. Okay, that's one study. So you want to get your vitamins from food, not from tablets. And here's another one. Um, get a bunch of people uh, and, and divide them into two groups. You're, you, everybody's going to go to the gym. You're going to go to the gym. You're going to go there for three days a week. You're going to be under supervision for one hour. And you'll have people who will take you through various programs and at the end of that time, if you just sort of just kept on going regular like normal uh, and going to the gym, you would on average put on about a kilogram of muscle and simultaneously lose a kilogram of fat. So your shape changed, but your weight stayed pretty well the same, but you had more muscle and less fat. However, that was just group one. Group two were told to take antioxidant tablets immediately after each training session. Their weight stayed the same um, and they didn't put on the muscle. They did not put on muscle. So taking antioxidants through tablet form actually can do bad things to you. There you are, an answer. And I'll drink your water to celebrate while I'm thinking about it. You deserve it. Okay, so uh, next question. Uh, at the time of any cut, do you know if there will be a scar? Is the prevalence of a scar based more on the deepness or wideness of a cut or time the wound is open? Um, so, oh. yep, you go. That's, that's hard. <laughs> okay, so with regard to a scar, um, what happens? Hang on, my wife is asking me for lunch. So I'll just let her know that I'll call her back <laughs> in a second. All right, because I do like to meet my wife for lunch when I'm here at the university. Um, if you do an operation, on somebody who hasn't been born yet, who's still in the uterus, mate, no scars. And if you can do the operation in the, the cutting in the epidermis outside the skin, you can end up with no scars. But sometimes you can end up with a scar if you cut deeply enough. Uh, and also, depending on your genetic background, you can have a thing called keloid. Um, so the depth of the cut and where it is can cause a scar. I'm not enough of a surgeon to know. I've forgotten all my stuff, so I'll just bow up before I make any big mistakes. Okay, next question. Okay. Um, this is a pretty general question, but how long before you think we hit our peak smartness? 
Um, I don't think we'll ever reach it. Uh, what's going to happen is we are in the situation, and I'm just going to tell my wife uh, lunch. Yep. Yep. Okay, good. Um, I think that we're going to, we are in a situation that we can actually modify our own DNA. We are the first creature that can do that. And so the first stage using genetic tools such as CRISPR, invented by two female scientists, and then Fuchsia won a Nobel Prize last year, and there will be better tools, C-R-I-S-P-R. -R. What matters is not what it stands for, but what it can do. And we reckon with CRISPR, we can start off with a living Rottweiler dog and shrink it down to a living Chihuahua. Not that the Rottweiler gives birth to the Chihuahua, but it shrinks it down the same dog. We see something like this happening in the marine iguanas in the Galapagos Islands, where when times are bad, they shrink down by 20%. It's not that they lose 20% of their body weight, but their skull, their bones, their joints, everything gets smaller and then gets bigger again. And we don't know how they do it. So we'll start, I'm guessing, with genetics uh, in the early stages of um, removing nasty diseases out of our DNA, like cystic fibrosis, and then get up to improving us, whatever that means, or regrowing body parts, um, and then get to the stage of being able to do this on uh, limbs in the body and the whole 400 different cell types, so that instead of the cells aging, via apoptosis, look it up on Wikipedia, A-P-O-P-T-O-S-I-S, -S, which is natural aging, natural cell death. We'll stop that and we'll end up with a stage where we're living 500 to 5,000 years with a healthy 18 to 25 year old body. Yeah, I know predictions are very difficult to make, especially about the future. And then from there, um, as, as a part of that, we'll change ourselves into different shapes. I'm looking at what sort of shape we need to live on Mars with our spacesuit. Freeman Dyson says the proper shape for a human being is a cloud of iron vapor weighing 50 kilograms, the diameter of a planet floating through space, navigating on magnetic fields. And as far as I'm concerned, even if it's just a cloud of iron vapor, if it can say, hi, Carl, how's your day been? I reckon it's human. And so part of that will be become smarter, but also with implants. Um, and also I reckon we'll get uh, quantum computers uh, implanted in so that we'll talk with them. You can obviously see that I read far too much science fiction, Dr. Cass. So we'll just stop there. <laughs> okay. All right, before we move on, we've got quite a few questions about climate change, but before yep. we move there, we'll just have yep. one last uh, question. Uh, yep. Is it true our hair can go white overnight from an emotional shock? There are reports in the literature, but almost certainly the hair did not go white overnight. You have 100,000 scalps, hairs on your scalp. I, I have fewer, um, which are manufactured by 100,000 hair follicles. The hair follicle pushes out at a few centimetres each month. It pushes out and dye is injected into it. Once the dye is injected into it, you can't just make it come out. But what happens is you can have a condition called alopecia areata. Look it up in Wikipedia. Alopecia, A-L-O-P-E-C-I-A, -E areata, A-R-E-A-T-A, -E where some of your hairs, which are a bit different, can fall out. So you can end up at a stage in your life where first you start off with jet black hair and then you end up with entirely white hair. And in between, you can have what they call pepper and salt or gray, and you can have a shock to the system or this immune system called, this immune thing called alopecia areata, or the shock which causes the same thing, where all the hair follicles that are generating, or all the hairs that are brown or black fall out. So you've got a mixture, and then the brown ones fall out in a, in a day or two. And then you're left with what apparently is white overnight, and to the outside world, you, that, that's what it looks like but they haven't turned white. You've just lost the dark ones. Good answer. Okay, so um, moving on to climate change. Uh, we've got here a question. What kind of checklist can you recommend for the average household to do to help stop offset the effects of climate change? Um, on one hand, it's a good thing to do, to do everything you can. Um, uh, and if you go to those reports, they'll talk about that, the BZE, the, 
the Beyond Zero Emissions Report and also drawdown.org. But the but you're limited in what you can do because you're part of society. So the term carbon footprint was invented by BP, the fossil fuel company, as a way of guilt tripping the regular person. And so on one hand, the fossil fuels had set up society so that you had no choice but to burn fossil fuels if you wanted your energy. Um, but on the other hand, they were trying to guilt trip us. It was kind of like in the early days of the 18th century, of, of the 1800s, where there were people trying to stop slavery in the United States and the United Kingdom. And the people who were in, in favor of slavery were saying, ha ha, look at you, you're wearing clothes made by slaves. And you're trying to get rid of slavery, you're a hypocrite. And they're saying, no, we want to change the system. So the way it works with regard to carbon footprint is that if you're on Australia's just internal um, usage of, car of carbon, we're about 20, 25 tons of carbon per person per year. If you include our exports, we're over 80. We're one of the heaviest generators of carbon dioxide in the world. America's about 20. India's about two tons of carbon dioxide per person per year. Okay, now consider, I've only got these figures for an American person, consider an American homeless person. Their clothes are throw off. They don't have a car. They don't burn electricity. They get their food from a soup kitchen. They sleep under newspapers in, in a, uh, under a bus shelter or a truck. In America, even though they're consuming virtually nothing, because they live in a society which provides them with what they've got, the newspapers and the, the soup kitchen, they're using eight or generating eight tons of carbon dioxide per year, which is four times what's happening in India. So the, in Australia, all the obvious things, depending on whether you're a house owner or a renter, because uh, it gets harder, and it's the solar cells and there's a personal reduction, but don't beat yourself up over it if you want, want to um, you know, have a good time in your life, because the big change comes at the very top by uh, getting the fossil fuel companies out of business. They're just making a product that is bad for the planet, just like slavery was bad for the planet. So read those books to find out what to do as an individual. Well, speaking of the top, um, we've got a question here. Australia are big polluters, as you've mentioned, with access to big dollars for supporting change. Will wealthier countries be enough to tip the balance given there are other countries who are big polluters with limited dollars to change? You have to start somewhere. Um, and when you're talking about the dollars, um, bear in mind, uh, the, the two reports by the International Monetary Fund, who are very hard-nosed people, and they wrote a report in 2013, followed by one in 2019, each called Energy Subsidy Reforms. Now, the International Monetary Fund, very hard-nosed people. They do not have a sense of humour about being kind and setting up libraries. They just talk about money. And they looked at the figures with regard to fossil fuel companies, and it turned out that for their 2013 report, looking back at 2011, because it takes a while to get all the data together, that the fossil fuel companies get a subsidy, not an investment. Investment, you have to pay back. Subsidy, you don't have to pay back. It's free money. They get a subsidy of, uh, back then, of around $1.8 trillion. And you're thinking, what does that mean in real stuff? It's about 2.5% of the entire GDP for the entire planet, or, wait for it, 8% of all the revenue generated by every government on Earth. So $0.08 cents out of every dollar that the governments earn on Earth, planet Earth, they give as a present to the fossil fuel companies, don't know why, in both the 2013 report and the 2019 report. There is easily enough money in the system to fix global warming. However, 8% of all of the money in the system is being given to about two dozen companies that have made enormous profits. So when the head of Exxon left, his um, exit package was 400 million. Is that roughly the same as yours, Cass, that the university, you've negotiated with the university? I'm going for 500 million yeah, myself. That's my salary, yeah. 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 Right. So there's enough money in the system. And bear in mind this, <laughs> Australia has virtually the same GDP as Russia. 
but they've got a space program and nuclear weapons and an air force and a navy. They've even got submarines, apparently. And, and, and they, you know, they make stuff like cars. How come we've got roughly the same amount of wealth within 25%, but we don't make anything? Where does our money go? Follow the money is the answer. You'll see where it goes. Okay, we've got time for a couple more questions. Yep. Um, as of now, there's a new variation of COVID um, and it's called Lambda variation. Would the cycle indefinitely continue? Would the virus keep adapting to our vaccines that we keep improving and producing? Uh, the answer is don't know. Um, if you go, go reading up on it, and there's some very good documentation around, and especially Corona cast, on one hand, the flu virus is arranged in a different way that mutations are much faster for it to do and more easy. But on the other hand, the coronavirus doesn't mutate so fast, so you wouldn't expect it to be that nasty. But on the other hand, the other, other hand, we've got the example of the chickens, where we've got about 400 lethal viruses roaming the world. So on what will happen with humans, either they'll stay really nasty for the next 40 years, or they'll just gradually become harmless, like the ones in our nose, the coronaviruses, or something in between. Either way, we've got the example of the chickens. Get vaccinated every six months for the next 30 years. You know, like, I, I don't know about you, Cass, but I get kind of annoyed that I have to make the sheets on my bed every six months, whether they need it or not. Uh, by the way, I've, I've got a neat little trick I learned when I was a hippie, but you didn't know this one, Cass. If you vacuum your sheets, you get a bit longer out of them before you have to wash them. Wow. Have you ever That's vacuumed really your sheets? Look, I can't say I have, but, you know, there's a first for everything. Maybe, maybe this afternoon. I'll give it a go. Okay, <laughs> last question. Last question. Is residue left by a rocket launch or landing? Could we tell if there was a launch or landing on the moon or Mars centuries ago? Well, yes. Um, if a rocket was used to launch a payload off the surface of the moon, Definitely, there's residue that would be left behind that would be unique to that rocket. There's very little weather on the moon. All you get is space weather, which is dumping out a million tonnes of charged particles every second from the sun in all directions. So the residue upon the moon, which is a moderate way out and a very small target, is microscopic. On one hand, it, it does seem that we'll lose the first footprints on the moon in about 3 million years from the constant rain of micrometeorites. So yes, if there were another civilization that did rocket launches from the moon a few hundred, a few centuries ago, we should be able to see the residue from those rocket launches on the moon. But if they were that advanced a few centuries ago, they were ahead of us, mate, they wouldn't be using rockets, they'd be using ergonomic in integral brain power, I think, therefore I want to be somewhere else. And they just get there with magnetic fields or something like that. They, they wouldn't be using this, the primitive technology we have today. Okay. Thanks, think, Carl. Um, there is a, there's a last uh, request, I think, for another sing-along to Dr. Doctor. Maybe you could take us out with that. Um, but sure. firstly, I just want to thank everyone for attending this session uh, today and thank again the wonderful Dr. Carl um, and we hope to see you again um, at our next lunchtime uh, Lunchbox Science or another event in person you never know live in person maybe next year um, oh. but you never know over over to Carl and maybe here we go into yes. the song <laughs> and there we go and sharing and here we go Okay, that's as good as I can do. I'm not a very good singer. I have been out of training for a little while. Although I do have a few songs of mine on TikTok, including one where I teach people how to use microphones in the TikTok called Magic Mic. Amazing. I think we'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks again. Thanks for joining us.